What if we lived in a world where racial literacy was as natural as breathing and love was seen as the solution to all things? Now, think about how racially literate, loving teachers can improve the academic outcomes for black and brown children in schools. Take a moment to remember when you felt loved by a teacher or a principal. Hold that feeling. Now imagine what it would mean if every child who walked into a school building felt that, felt loved by their teacher, their principal, their classmates. Afrocentric scholar Dr. Asa Hilliard once said, I have never encountered any children and any group who are not geniuses. There is no mystery on how to teach them. The first thing you do is treat them as human beings. And the second thing you do is love them. We have yet to realize the genius in all of our students and learn how to love them because most of their teachers and educational leaders lack racial literacy. Racial literacy requires the truth about our personal and our collective histories. There are six components to the racial literacy development model. I'll say a moment, say something about that in a moment. But what's most important to understand is that racial literacy requires a deep self-reflection. It calls on us to challenge our ideas, to recognize our biases, and to change what interferes with love. I call this process archaeology of self. And for me, my research and my practice is centered on archaeology of self. Now, archaeology of self as a turn doesn't really show up in education. Of course, there is Michel Foucault's archaeology of knowledge. The term briefly appears in a paper on literary analysis, and not surprisingly, the term also briefly appears in the fields of psychology and mindfulness. I didn't know any of this years ago when the language of archaeology of self came to me. You can imagine how excited I was when I thought I had invented a new term, <laughs> only to find out that a paper on literary analysis using archaeology of self was published while I was still in high school. Now, we needed archaeology of self back then, I'm sure. We certainly need it now. We live in such a divided world. There's poverty and war and the threat of war always looming. And sadly, this is not new. As a country, we have always lived with war and stereotypes about others that have created separation and struggle. But we have also experienced powerful moments of progress through movements that have shaped history. And these movements have been possible because people have embraced the truth of a difficult situation and decided to fight to change it. Now, I believe this same approach can work when we are teaching black and brown children. But we have to build our racial literacy, our capacity for deep self-reflection, and love those that we have been taught not to. As a professor of education, I spend most of my time working with school personnel and pre-service teachers building their racial literacy. Racial literacy is a theory and a practice that allows us to talk honestly and openly and examine the truths and the myths about race, about racism and other ideas that, quite frankly, erode our humanity. Racial literacy provides tools for us to assess the world, signaling to us where we can make a difference. Let me share a story with you that perhaps will help you understand why we need racial literacy. In December 2018, a video of a mother and her toddler goes viral on social media. Within a few days, this mother interrogating her daughter about who ate the box of Mrs. Kipling's angel food cakes 
receives nearly three million views. Following the logic of her mother's questioning, the little girl denies eating any of the cakes, and in fact, she insists that someone broke into their home and ate the box of Mrs. Kipling's cakes. <laughs> the mother is confused, but she continues to question. You mean they didn't take the jewelry? They didn't take the TV? They only took Mrs. Kipling's angel food cakes? <laughs> The little girl looks up at her mom and down to the floor and up at her mom again, and she says, yes, and it was a black man. The mother breaks into uproarious laughter. The little girl sighs with relief because she's no longer in trouble. The toddler and her mom are white. Now, I have seen this video several times, nearly 40 times, since it was released a few years ago. And each time I watch it, it is equally unnerving and disappointing. But it serves as a reminder for me of the work that still needs to be done with adults on their racist beliefs, because those racist beliefs pose danger to the next generation. Just by laughing, the mother affirmed negative stereotypes and tropes about black men, passing on a racist way of thinking to her daughter. She missed the opportunity to build her daughter's racial literacy because her own racial literacy had not been developed. Racial literacy was coined as a term um, by sociologist Dr. Frances Wendance Twine about 20 years ago. I started writing about racial literacy in 2011, and in 2018, with the help of my dear colleague, Dr. Angela Costa, created this visual representation that I call the racial literacy development model. This was my attempt to bring theory and practice together in education. The model consists of six components, critical love, critical humility, critical reflection, historical literacy, or archaeology of self, and very important, the act of interruption. In our world, we have moved further and further away from the core humanistic values of love, of humility, of reflection, and the need to self-correct when we are thinking wrongly about someone else. I can't help but think that if at some point during her educational experiences, that that mom, if she had the opportunity to build her racial literacy and engage in an archaeology of self, examining those ideas, those beliefs, those stereotypes that she held about black men, that that would have been a very different video. Performing the archaeology of self can start tomorrow. In fact, you can start right now. But first, you have to be honest about what you believe, in this case, about race, and be willing to change your beliefs. Engaging in building racial literacy and an archaeology of self and deciding to love, well, that can return us to some of our human values. And I will say that there is quite the risk if we do not start this work today. If we do not start the work of building racial literacy, engaging in deep self-reflection, and deciding to love, it will lead us down a path for which we so desperately need a detour. Racism, homophobia, anti-blackness, religious bias. All of these ideologies lead to misunderstandings and hateful acts. But deciding to engage in eradicating our racist beliefs and returning to love can restore our humanity. And now, which one of us doesn't need a little help with that? Here is a rendering of the model in the form of a shovel to indicate the deep digging that is required of the work of racial literacy. It is important that we make a commitment to decide to do things differently, to face 
what doesn't always make us look so great. Now, I know this up close and personal view of ourselves can be uncomfortable. Radical honesty is usually uncomfortable. But I want you to consider that in facing a lot of our beliefs that are rooted in bias, to face that, to decide to examine, to excavate, and to interrupt those beliefs can be so empowering. I feel that power every time I reflect on who I am as an educator, as an interrupter, as a daughter, as a mother, as a friend, and as a lover. I constantly examine my life. I have decided to live a life of excavation. <laughs> Let me share a personal story with you. In March 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, I published my first book of poetry, Love from the Vortex and Other Poems. A year later, still in the pandemic, I published my second book of poetry, The Peace Chronicles. These two books are artifacts of my archaeological dig around romantic love, intimacy, familial bonds, and deciding to live a life of peace. Before the pandemic, and certainly uh, during it, I thought a lot about the romantic relationships that I had over the past 30 years, what they taught me about myself, my lack of self-love. <clears throat> and I'll have to tell you that in writing these two books, it freed me. I wrote to free and heal myself, but it required that I do some deep self-digging about what did I really believe about what constitutes a healthy romantic relationship. What this particular archaeological dig did for me is that it taught me the value, the value of deep self-reflection, of truth, of self-love, and deciding to live a life of peace no matter the circumstances. And what I am submitting to you is that this is a life that we all can lead if we have the courage. Now, it seems like starting with the self is a basic step. It is basic, but it is one of the most difficult first steps to make. Just ask anyone who has entered therapy to try and heal the wounds that life often brings. Therapy requires that we hold up a mirror and examine our own role in our pain, but also in our healing. Education can learn a lot from therapy, right? Education systems often look at the external, the data, the test scores. Rarely, if ever, does it turn the mirror on those who run the system. We are the system. What we believe makes our practices. Repeating those practices evolve into policies. If harmful beliefs are not examined, excavated, and interrupted, those beliefs just rage on, ignoring the humanity of others, eroding our own, and ruling out the possibility for love. Racial literacy, archaeology of the self, gives us an opportunity to restore our humanity. Every time I do work with an educator and I ask them to deeply dive within on what they believe, I'm doing the work of archaeology of self. Teachers, administrators, any adults in the life of children must be honest about what they truly believe about the academic ability and the humanity of black and brown children. Now, doing so just might set us on the path to a racially literate world where loving black and brown children can be as natural as breathing. Thank you.